perhaps, maybe. You may wonder what punishment you received to be assigned to the audit committee at 8 o'clock in the morning. I can't answer that question. Um, but thank you for those of you who are here being here. Um, we have a number of items to cover this morning, the principal matter of which is to address the um, proposed audit committee charter, which will give direction to our work going forward. And Mr. Harper is with us this morning to explain how that charter was derived and some suggestions about its content. And with that, I'm going to ask you to proceed. Good morning, Good morning. Madam Chair, governors and members of the audit committee. Uh, we begin in earnest this morning the process of establishing uh, by adoption of an audit committee charter that the Board of Governors and in particular this audit committee has clearly delineated the duties and responsibilities that it will carry out and clearly stated that it has the authority to do so and also in the same vein clearly delineated the responsibilities of the Office of Inspector General and Director of Compliance and that it has sufficient authority to carry out its mission. I want to begin especially with, with just a little bit of an editorial comment. I, I like the way Chair Pappas said, we began our first meeting in December at 8 a.m. The process that we're going through is absolutely essential. The Board of Governors is accountable and has as its mission to govern and provide oversight and advancement of the state university system. That system is becoming increasingly uh, complex and the issues regarding audit, investigation, and matters of accountability becoming more uh, difficult to identify and to apply resources necessary for this board and for the universities to make decisions about what it has to do. What is the audit committee chart? What, what I hope to uh, accomplish and the objectives of my brief presentation to you this morning is twofold. The draft sent to you is not an action item. That is, at the end of my presentation, I am not going to be asking on behalf of staff, nor will you be uh, responsible for submitting this document to the Board of Governors for fi final approval. But the process that I'm going to suggest is that we have to review both the essential factors necessary and elements of an audit charter to define the duties and responsibilities and to make sure that they're clear. In this particular instance, to use a cliche, one size definitely doesn't fit all. At the end of what I'm going to do, which is a brief review of the document itself, I'm going to ask you to also discuss with me and give me your guidance in three areas. First of all, after we look at the objectives of the charter, and I will discuss that in brief, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the parties and individuals that we need to seek guidance, comment, and suggestions from. Some of them I know, many of them uh, will be easily identifiable, but definitely in terms of making sure that the audit committee charter and its duties and responsibilities are clear and they're customized to fit the needs of the state university system, we need to gain input from key individuals and other groups. Secondly, I want to talk very briefly about some of the issues that I have identified and that we have, in consultation with Chancellor Rosenberg, identified that we must come to grips with. Now, part of the process I want to emphasize is that after this presentation and after this meeting, we will send you another version of this document and schedule individual briefings with you. Uh, for example, I thought that uh, a judgment had to be made, and I did discuss this with Chair Pappas, about whether at this meeting we gave you all of the reference documents, the documents upon which we relied uh, to develop this. Some of those are critical and they need to be reviewed, and I think that that will be part of that process. In addition, it will give me and the rest of the staff an opportunity to get your individual insights, guidance, and comments and suggestions. At our next meeting, when we can decide when that would be, another uh, draft of the document can be presented and we can decide how to go forward. Lastly, after we look at the basic elements and overview, we need to discuss the process for going forward and I have some suggestions about how to do that. Uh, one thing I do want to emphasize too is that <laughs> interrupt me at any time. This is an interactive discussion. Uh, I apologize in advance. I do have uh, somewhat of a script. But in this particular instance, it's being able to get your guidance that is most important to us. 
I want to acknowledge right now that the document in front of you is a draft. It's not just my work product. I consulted closely with Chancellor Rosenberg. And in addition to that, we retain the services of Dr. Samara Kramer. She could not join us this morning, but she has extensive experience in higher education as a professor, in government, as an official, in various roles with the Department of Children and Families, a Ph.D. in finance, and also has worked as an inspector general and a director of auditing services. I'll talk a little bit about that when I go into how we crafted this particular document. But I wanted to acknowledge her assistance in this. Now, any questions at this point in time? Does anyone want to take a coffee break now? Shall I trudge ahead? No, go ahead. I will. Very well. What are we talking about? The State University Audit Council, made up of internal auditors, developed a white paper that was presented to this group some time ago. There was a quote in that paper from a prominent CEO of a major corporation. I want to just read that to you because it encapsulates much better than I think anything I've read so far what we're about. It goes as follows, and I quote, Proper corporate governance is the cornerstone of all internal control systems. Governance means establishing, communicating, and enforcing clear accountabilities and responsibilities. And, as far as I'm concerned, the three most critical roles in governance belong to the internal auditor, the board's audit committee, and the CEO. All three must be fully engaged, all three must take leadership roles, and all three must work closely together. So what the audit committee charter, which is a document, I simply define it as the guidepost, the constitution, so to speak, of our duties and authority, is about making sure that we are in this particular instance, providing governance and providing it in some of the critical areas in order to establish accountability. Now, as many of you know, Sarbanes-Oxley grew out of scandals in the private sector. The internal audit function has been in existence for many, many years and is a mature function in the state university system and throughout the country. However, the audit committee function has also been around for some time. I'm going to go directly to the document itself, if you'll pull that out. Do each of you have a copy of it? If not, we have copies in the back. All right. In the introduction, we repeat uh, what that quote tries to encapsulate. That is that the audit committee should be about achieving the goals and objectives of the particular organization, in this case the state university system, by providing a systematic and disciplined approach to the evaluation and of the board's operations and to be primarily responsible for improving effectiveness of the organization's risk management, control, and governance process. The charter shall establish that the audit committee has the necessary authority to carry out its duties. In that third full paragraph down, just to highlight, uh, because you've had a chance to review this, I know, to some extent, a philosophy of internal auditing is simply that it adds value to the operations of the board. Now, you can get much more detailed, complex, or technical about it, but I think that hits the essence of internal auditing. Compliance activities, and I will submit to you that the compliance process, at least in terms of a systematic uh, design of a compliance program, is less mature in the state university system is designed to provide management and other stakeholders with independent assurance that operations are being conducted in a manner that is fully consistent with all applicable laws, rules, regulations, policies, and also policies of this particular organization. Gary, I have a question on, on the audit and compliance relationship. Mm -hmm. At one point in the workshop that was held I, months ago now, I thought there was a discussion about a trend to segregate the audit and compliance function. Um, and can you just refresh my recollection on that? Is that accurate? You are correct. Now, the, the reasons for that are numerous, but they get down to this. Compliance is, in essence, how you're going to correct those issues that might be of, of not just problematic, but of grave concern and risk. That is, to do it in a systematic fashion. The compliance activity goes on each and every day in each of our institutions. However, is it structured? Is it systematic? Does it hit all of those areas? Because in, 
in brief, compliance is making sure you know what the rules, policies, and procedures are that they're being followed and that the individuals who are part of the organization or structure know what those are and they're trained on it. But to do it in a systematic function, best practices and also experiences has taught many organizations, including several of the universities, have designated one individual to coordinate the compliance activities. So it's separated because audit is and should be objective and independent. And the way I've generally described it, uh, Governor Pappas, is that compliance is more of a program function. Now one of the issues that I, I know I want to get feedback from this group on and from people who are at the institutions themselves is how does the Board of Governors help get us where we need to be? That is to have a systematic, organized, or uh, in this case an organizational structure that hits those, those key areas and brings value to the organizations as a whole. What I've also said is that I'm in a unique position. I cannot be perhaps the compliance director uh, for the state board office, but obviously I can be objective and independent in helping review and monitor compliance activities at the universities. Their own internal auditors at some point in time would reach uh, a point where they might be in a conflict. That is, this is a program that they also be, would be responsible for seeing if it's working properly and meeting its goals. That's really the, the rub. Sorry, I may have okay. taken, hopefully that's I answered your question. Thank you. That's <laughs> I want to say one thing, too, about the document. In crafting it, Dr. Kramer and I and Chancellor Rosenberg took the approach that we're going to put everything in. I mean, I submit to you based on authoritative sources. We relied upon not just NACUBO, but the Institute of Internal Auditors model for audit charters. We reviewed audit charters of the state university systems, of other state agencies, and of the private sector. So in this way, this document does meet all of the essential elements necessary for a charter. And again, to repeat, what it misses or what it does not have is the imprimatur of your input about what is needed and what needs to be customized to fit the needs of the State University System of Florida. All right? Uh, Terry, I think the Chancellor had a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, just as a footnote to your question, the, the university, the State University System has a mix of institutions, some that are more mature, others that are maturing, if you will and the compliance capability varies across the range of institutions. And what we're trying to do here is sensitize particularly newer institutions of the challenges that come with rapid growth, whether it's in managing federal research or simply being much more engaged in community or federal activities and the needs to ensure that everybody's appropriately understanding what the regulatory framework is for that growth. So I see compliance as a proactive exercise, whereas auditing clearly is reactive. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, one other thing about the document, uh, and I, I reviewed it as you might imagine many, many times. It is in some ways internally redundant, but there is a reason for that, because some of the themes need to be emphasized again, not only to make sure that it is understood, but also to see how it fits into the overall governance structure of the audit committee and the duties and responsibilities of the primary internal auditor. So I'll just say that in the past. Of course, that's a valid criticism, and we're going to work to not uh, be redundant when it's only when it's necessary. The next section is organization. Now, you know that one pretty well, but I do want to highlight on page two uh, just a couple of lines from that first full paragraph. Uh, that first full paragraph begins, the essential functions of the audit committee are. Now, the information that follows is from research done uh, and presented in the white paper by SUAC and from the Association of, of not the Association of Inspector Generals, excuse me, from other reliable sources, including the institution, Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, which is a international organization of internal auditors. We relied upon them in particular for what are the duties and responsibilities of the audit committee. It will be this group's responsibilities to refine those, to define them in a way that fits uh, what the needs of the Board of Governors and the State University system are. But I wanted to highlight that just for a minute because these are the basics. Let's call it uh, things that we think we would submit have to be a part of this function. The audit committee should provide oversight of internal audit. That is, provide oversight of the Inspector General's office, it provide oversight of the internal audit function in the state university system. 
and also provide oversight of compliance and ethics-related activities, review significant accounting and reporting issues, review risk assessment methodologies, risk management policies, and assess the effectiveness of the internal control system, that is, the other elements of the internal control system, and review any report of significant audit or compliance-related findings and recommendations. When I get to my brief status report on the task force on FAMU, uh, the Chancellor has already done this on many occasions, but I had occasion to be asked questions, well, Mr. Harper, are any of these particular issues that you're looking at in that regard occurring in other universities? One of the duties and responsibilities of the Audit Committee, based upon the uh, reviews being conducted by the universities, is to identify those key areas, if there are trends, see if they should be impacted or should be approached with policies directly related to those particular trends. That is, to keep it simple, do we have audit findings that show a pattern? This committee will be responsible for monitoring that with the assistance, of course, of my office and the other auditors and folks in this business throughout. I think that is a vital function that this committee can serve. In the last part of that paragraph, just to quote very shortly, the Audit Committee shall also provide guidance on how to establish and maintain strong working relationships with the external auditors and other stakeholders and assist the Board in obtaining adequate funding and resources needed by the Inspector General to fulfill his or her mandated duties. Uh, I was asked uh, by one of the other members of the Committee that the Charter itself and the, the process that we're going through has to have resources in which to do so. Uh, my response to that is, if you don't have those resources, how are you going to do them? My response to that question was, first we have to have a plan, then we have to be able to make the case that is, is vital, then we have to go about asking those sources of funding that we do have, including the legislature for funding to do so. The fact that I'm standing here was the Chancellor's uh, uh, decision to have an Inspector General and that to get the funding necessary to do so. Uh, I would be the last person as a professional and as someone who is bound to serve this group to tell you that you can do this without resources. So I just wanted to highlight that. That is one of the critical issues that this group, I'm sure, is going to come to grips with, not just in this particular function, but in many other areas. Again, I'm going to move along very quickly, Madam Chair. In that same section, the Inspector General shall provide leadership and oversight of audit and compliance functions for the Board and the State University System, and is generally responsible for coordinating activities that promote accountability, integrity, and efficiency as required by law. There is one distinction. The Inspector General Act dictates to a significant extent the duties and responsibilities of the Inspector General. I will be responsible for performing those and complying with that statute, subject also to a review by the Auditor General as mandated by, by, uh, by law of whether I'm meeting those. The internal auditors and investigators at the universities are not subject to those same duties and responsibilities which is why when we get to the section under responsibilities, it tracks the legal requirements of the Inspector General Act. Any questions? Okay. The authority section is a primary section of any charter. It cites, of course, the, the Constitution, and also, as it, in this instance, again, uh, references the Inspector General Act and the fact that uh, the Inspector General should provide the central point for coordination of all activities related to accountability. Professional standards. I've been asked many times, uh, what is the difference between an audit and some other review conducted by my office? The, the, the short answer is an audit is not hard to define, but you have to have professional standards to call it an audit. The Office of uh, Inspector General and the other internal auditors rely upon those standards to make that decision. If the document and the report and review that we conduct does not meet those standards, it should not be called an audit. That is, it cannot be called an audit applicable to those standards. The three primary standards that uh, we suggest have to be followed are the standards promulgated by the Institute of Internal Auditors. It's called the International Standards for, for Professional Practice of Internal Auditing. Because we are government related, the Comptroller General has issued government auditing standards which have to be followed in certain instances. And we also submit in this particular instance, since the Inspector General has to perform other functions, the preeminent institution for developing standards in that area is the Association of Inspector Generals, of which I'm proud to say I'm a member. Uh, you may hear me say from time to time, even though I'm not going to fall into that vernacular, 
the Institute of Internal Auditors standards are called the Red Book. That's the common vernacular. The government auditing standards, the Yellow Book, and the Association of Inspector Generals, the Green Book. Now, I want to spend just a few more minutes on independence. The charter here follows the guidance given to us and best practice, the guidance given to me by uh, Chancellor Rosenberg and best practices in having a dual reporting mechanism. Now there are references that I can cite for that, but what it comes down to in the language there is that the Inspector General administratively reports to the Chancellor and shall also report functionally to the Audit Committee. Recent history, experience in the last 15 or 20 years makes it clear that having a dual reporting structure provides a better foundation for independence. That is, it is going to be my role to conduct audits, reviews, investigations of the operations of the, uh, of the Board of Governor's Office, and in addition to that, as is quoted here, not be subject to supervision by any other employee of, that, of the State University Office. These are, again, not just best practices, but when you think about it, they make just good sense. That is, this group will, will be, as the Audit Committee and the Board of Governors, also my boss. You will be able to give direction and guidance, and in those cases where there might be any conflict, be the final arbiter of how that is to be resolved. A cornerstone, uh, I believe, of a sound governance structure. Now the next sections go through in more detail and in bullet form the scope of work of the internal audit function, the investigations function, again lifted if you look at page five uh, from the statute and the law, and the compliance function. And I want to tell you that the compliance function is where I will be engaging in more discussion with you. What should the board's role be in setting, either by best practices or by, by rule, regulation, et cetera, the compliance activities at the universities? How should they be structured? For example, several of the universities have gone the next step, designated one person as the compliance officer, provided resources for that. Others of our universities, as the chancellor pointed out, don't have as robust or mature an organizational structure. What is the board's role in defining compliance and how it should be implemented here? Now, in the other activities, I call it other duties as a sign, and there are many. I wanted to make one point about independence. In the internal audit world and investigative world, once an, an item or a matter is put in the hands of the inspector general or the internal auditor, they must have the resources and authority to carry it out without interference, et cetera, and report those findings. But the direction, that is the approval of both the audit plan and how we go about conducting that, rests with the Board of Governors and with the Chancellor to the extent that he can say, here's an area of highest risk, go look there first. For example, if you'll look on page six, uh, oh, about the fifth bullet down, one of the responsibilities that I will have and that this board and committee needs to define in, in more specifics is to oversee and monitor audit follow-up follow -up activities of the university's offices of audit and compliance as appropriate, to work collaboratively and as a liaison with the board staff and compliance directors at the university to ensure development, implementation, and maintenance of compliance activities within the state university system. Now the next sections, audit planning and reporting, are pretty straightforward. I do want to emphasize in that last section, section eight on monitoring, that's on page eight, that the Office of Inspector General shall monitor the implementation of the board's response to any report on the board issued by the Office of the Auditor General and by the Office of Program Analysis and Government Accountability. One of the value added uh, functions of any internal audit or Inspector General function is to develop a relationship with the external auditors and in this case, the Auditor General in most instances, but also those independent auditors that conduct audits of our universities, other institutions. Uh, that is a role, of course, that we need to develop and continue to develop. And as I have uh, emphasized in several other presentations, we are definitely having that opportunity in the Task Force on FAMU project. Now, Madam Chair, that's the end of my presentation on this. I do want to go and answer questions before I talk about my suggestions for how we move the process forward. Okay, I think Governor Edwards has a question. In your, in your compliance role, would that, could that be uh, extended to include reviewing the numerous accountability measures and reports that we must file with the state? What 
I'm getting at uh, is a conversation that uh, the Accountability Committee had some time ago. There currently are literally hundreds of different reports that each university has to compile uh, in order to respond to a specific uh, designation in the legislature. It's extremely expensive, and we had hoped that we would be able to come up with a a format where there would just be three or four reports that hopefully could cover all of the areas that the state needed uh, to review. Obviously, we haven't had the staff at the time to, to, to go in that direction, even though that certainly is one of our goals. Would this be a function that could be included within your office? Yes, sir, it could. Now, the extent to which my office would be involved in that at least at this stage, I would suggest, would be to uh, review, monitor, become engaged so that I could report to you with the assistance of the individuals at the universities or groups at the universities responsible for compiling that. Uh, the model that I have that is in here, at least in terms of the role uh, based on our current governance structure, is the Chief Inspector General Act. Of course, that is the act I'm most familiar with. But it entails, of course, independent agencies operating in very complex situations with the Chief Inspector General, even though that's not my title, acting as a, a conduit between those agencies and, in this case, uh, the Board of Governors. So to the short answer to your question, Governor Edwards, part of our assessment of what kind of compliance uh, structure is necessary will be to look at that and how to work that. And one of the last things I'm going to say, and then I'm going to just answer questions, is that in order to determine what kind of compliance structure in my role, we're going to have to go through some assessment function. There are various ways of doing that, some very expensive, some that we'll have to discuss with the people who've already gone through it, and examples of how we can come to some, let's just say, definitive conclusions about how we should uh, handle those matters. Good morning. I comment not specifically, uh, Governor Edwards, but we have such limitations with, with the uh, number of staff that uh, Mr. Harper can call on for help. And so as we start this political process, all of you that have uh, access to, to this process, please help us with this because there are so many needs and we, we want to be accountable on every level. And we want to, to uh, take that seriously, but when you have the limitations that we do, it's very difficult. Thank you. Um, Yes, Governor. I guess that was kind of my question in following up with this is while this appears to be a very encompassing logical charter for everything we want to do, my concern with adopting it is can we actually do it given the resources we have now and are we setting a false expectation? You know, and I, I don't know what the answer is, but I agree these are things we need to be doing, but I just, if we don't have the staff to do it, should we be adopting a charter saying we're going to do it? Or how, or how do we reconcile that gap in what we're, what actions we should be taking as an audit committee? I, I'd, I'd like to respond to, at least in part to that, and I'm sure um, Mr. Harper also has a response. But there's really two components of this charter that are, and they're very different. One is, as a board of governors, we have a responsibility to conduct our affairs at the level of audit and compliance with the same degree of care and and appropriate management and function as we call upon our universities to perform. So in my view, it, it, it's our responsibility to figure out how to staff an appropriate audit and compliance process for our organization. I think that is a manageable exercise with, um, it, certainly there, there will be staffing challenges, but that's a manageable exercise. Our staff is relatively small. Our office is relatively small. And our function in terms of the normal audit process as it relates to operational controls and financial matters it, for our own office is not that extensive. So that component of it, I feel um, we simply have a, a burden and a responsibility to act in the, in the fashion that we expect of everyone else. The second component, which is to me the more discretionary item, um, is to what extent we have the reach to engage in the other activities that I would label as system-oriented activities in a productive way and, and 
that calls upon us to create a prioritization to your point that um, it depends upon how many, many people we have to do all this list of wonderful things. I think we've been judicious about jumping into that for a number of reasons because the universities don't need another auditor on top of their own audit function and the AG audit function. But I think in the conversations that Mr. Harper and I have had, the, our focus has been, and I've said this so many times, it's you know beyond repetitive, is value added. What are the elements of it that, for example, the Chancellor mentioned with regard to compliance, if, if we can help some of the younger institutions become more educated about how to handle the compliance function and coordinate communications between the universities on those basis, that is a valuable function that doesn't require a whole lot of our staff to do. But if you, when we participated in the audit workshop um, that was facilitated by this organization and brought all the universities together, it was a tremendous sharing of experiences that, that sent them off to create their own best practices model. So those are the kinds of things that we can do and need to be doing. So um, I would say that the staffing issue goes more to the issue of how much we embrace in those other activities. And we're going to have to look to Mr. Harper to give us guidance as to what he can effectively do as we embrace that and prioritize that list. And philosophically, I agree with you completely. I guess it was my, just my question was almost more into the actual document. I don't know that that is articulated here, that prioritization. It's almost like we are adopting the broader reach and are we setting that expectation? Because I agree with everything you said that that really should be our goal and our objective here and taking on those things. And I'm just, I, that was more my question was, does the charter address that clearly? Well, maybe one way to approach it or think about it is this should be an enabling document so that within, if it lists these things as with, within our purview, then there's, there is an action-oriented document that then establishes what it is we're going to take up at any point in time. So I think perhaps the language could be clarified to, to reach an enabling conclusion, mm -hmm. and and that maybe goes to your your concern. The um, the reason I think it's important that we deal with the enabling part as it relates to our um, system institutions is because the audit function has been unclear in the minds of the universities themselves as to so what are we going to be doing relevant to their activities, and I think some clarification in the enabling section mm -hmm. that we're not going to come in and audit their function um, is is appropriate. So I, I think maybe some guidance in that direction um, would be helpful about separating it from an action statement to more of an en enabling statement. Does that, that go that to your issue? And, and, and very briefly, that's the kind of dialogue and guidance that I need from you, Governor uh, Duncan, and the other members of the committee. The short answer to your question is I need to know where you think those priorities are and how we need to fashion it. And in addition to that, I've already said this now, I, I do believe twice, there are subject matter experts in the internal audit and compliance area in the state university systems that can offer their suggestions on how we do this. Not only how we craft the charter, but the plan that has to be developed to meet what the charter says the audit committee should do and what the internal audit and compliance function should look like. Uh, this is just the beginning of that process, and again, I said this before too, what we tried to do in this preliminary draft is put in at least the basic elements. Now we've got to decide what goes in, what goes, what, what needs to be taken out. And I guess just wearing my research and economic development hat, the one thing I would just throw out that I think we need to be mindful of is some of, you know, given if, if it falls under since the Board of Governors staff is supporting the Research and Technology Board, we have you know, a fairly significant amount of money going through a program that we're saying you know, they're going to be preparing internal stuff, but how we manage and do our control part over that, there's probably going to be some demand from this function in making sure that those funds and validating that because they aren't going to be necessarily directly at the institution. It's coming under a program that we support. So I just, from a staffing heads up, say that's 
coming. <laughs> well, that, that's very important input because I think what we need all of the committees of the board to do is advise um, Mr. Harper and the committee, this committee, of those kinds of alert areas because I don't necessarily know at that level um, what type of oversight we're having it in those functions. And so it is very appropriate to help um, Mr. Harper mm -hmm. focus on those activities. So any any other members of the board that would have similar issues, we need to know about them. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Chairman Pappas, I believe in talking to the legislators that this committee is the most important committee. They expect us to, uh, to fulfill the these functions, and we do need staff to do that. And I believe that I believe it's the most important thing to do. So, with your leadership, we need to, to have a plan and then go ask for staff to uh, to fulfill it. It's, it's very difficult, but it's most, if we don't have appropriate audit oversight, then the rest becomes very um, difficult. Well, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong very publicly. Governor Martin, you had a question? I concur with the uh, discussion that we've been having here this morning in regard to the staffing issue. But I guess my, my question is, what is the current staffing for the audit program? And obviously, if we adopt this today, then we would like to see a work plan that will actually spell out a certain degree of specificity in terms of what will be done. So my question is, with the current staffing, what is it, and when do you envision you come back with a staffing proposal that was appropriate? Well, first, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Harper, but I, we were not intending to adopt the charter today. The point was to begin this discussion so that it can go through an alliteration um, that is responsive to your all suggestions and concerns. And um, I'll let Mr. Harper respond to the current staffing. Yeah, that is correct, uh, Governor Martin. What, what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to find time on your, your schedule for us to have an individual briefing after we get input and uh, suggestions from at least some uh, easily identified key parties and individuals. We will discuss with you uh, what your views are on not only the charter, but how the function should operate. Then we will come back to this committee, uh, and I have not discussed this with the, the chair or with Chancellor Rosenberg, but I would suggest in March with a revised document that incorporates the guidance, suggestions, comments from not only the members of the audit committee, but from other uh, constituencies within the state university system and see where we are in terms of making the decisions, as Governor Duncan had pointed out, and Governor Pappas did too. What are our priorities? What is going to be the mandate? Do we have more in here than we can actually handle based on current resources? The short answer to the question about resources, I'll have to, the big answer at least, I'll have to leave to you and the members of the board. The short answer is, in this particular instance, we do have resources that have to be leveraged within the state university system. Uh, I don't want to leave the impression with this group or to the public that internal audit and compliance activities aren't ongoing right now, that investigative functions aren't being actively pursued by each of our state university system personnel. The fact is, is that coordinated? Are we getting as much out of that particular activity? And can we report out to the public and to the legislature in particular uh, whether there are any trends, whether an instance in this particular institution means that there's a problem system-wide? Uh, so that is what I am going to suggest, at least as a basic framework for the time being, and that's going to take some time to put in place. But again, in terms of number of staff for the Inspector General's office, how, how many do we have? Well, right now it's just myself, sir, it's dedicated staff. We've uh, in, uh, retained the services of Dr. Framer to help on the development of the audit charter and risk assessment and audit plan, which we're still working on. And in addition to that, of course, the Chancellor can speak to what his plan is for trying to obtain additional funding for it. Audit staff. I'm sure you want me to address that. Uh, well, please do if you'd like to. The members of the board should recall that the it was expected that the audit responsibility of the Board of Governors would be carried out by the Department of Education. 
and so we had virtually zero capability independent to be responsive to your concerns prior to July 1. The, the board had earlier requested support when there was, when there were resources and we were denied. Uh, so we did perhaps as a consequence of uh, the circumstances with uh, FAMU then receive support from the legislature to hire an auditor and to hire an assistant general counsel. We combined the funds for those two positions and and hired the inspector general who had obviously significant experience and the breadth of understanding of the full range of responsibilities to give you a sense that we were able to cross levels in terms of your uh, responsibilities. Currently, uh, there is no funding for any other support staff. We have seconded uh, support staff from other units. We uh, do not have at this point a financial capability to build the kind of uh, responsive professional unit that my expectation is that you would like to have for us to do the job that we'll need to do. The staff that Mr. Harper has is being paid with one-time money that is exclusively focused upon support for the task force that we've set up that will eventually sunset, but that one-time money, of course, will disappear uh, with the end of the fiscal year. So I think Governor Duncan is on point that we do not yet have the capability that would match the responsibilities uh, to carry out even at uh, a uh, at a, full, at a full operational level. And I can't give you the assurance today that the <clears throat> audit reports that we are getting from the Auditor General are being given the diligence by our staff to give you the assurance that, um, that we know what's going on. Further, if we uh, take our responsibility seriously across time, the real point of our capability will be, should be focused upon working with the audit committees of each of the boards to make sure that their ability to understand what their responsibilities are, are, you know, even across the entire system. We have excellent audit committees at this point. But I would say that the, the ability of the audit committees to ask the right questions does vary, which is not in our interest. And the, ch the timeliness of the questions that they ask it, it also varies in accordance with the changing nature of the federal, regu regu federal and state regulatory environment. So we have, we have um, a lot of things that we could do at the system and at the policy level, not even at the operational level, that at this point we um, don't yet have the capability to do. But in five years, you know, we should. You should expect that. And that's what I think that this discussion uh, can be about. But at this point, uh, Mr. Harper is it. I, I think the reason that, that we're dealing with the charter here today is because it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate how this function is going to operate and what it is that we will undertake to do to justify the kinds of staffing um, needs that that we have. If we if we start with the staffing discussion prior to the charter, it, in my opinion, it inevitably devolves down into we don't need more auditors to audit our universities. And I think what we're trying to do with this document is to demonstrate that that is not the function of this committee nor of the Board of Governors in relationship to the universities, that there's a lot that we can be doing to strengthen audit and compliance in the university system that allows them to do their jobs more effectively. And that's what this document needs to be 
setting forth, and that becomes the justification for the staffing supplements that we need in order to do that effectively. But I can tell you from the vantage point that I'm in of having dealt with the audit process so far, the addition of Mr. Harper, it was a very, very challenging process as we went through some issues with our universities and in reading the audits and trying to be responsive. We actually wound up in instances in which the Department of Education's audit function felt they had a conflict of interest with the Board of Governors in trying to respond to our needs of oversight. So it's a very broken system, and we've got to find a way to fix it. So this is the first step. Just one other point to echo Governor Chair Roberts' point. At the last, at an October meeting of the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, several members of that committee made it very clear to me that they expected us to be engaged, and between the lines what they were saying is, of course you have the capability because we expect you to be engaged. So we're going to have to find a way to get the capability in the short term even if we don't have the resources, which means that once we get the charter and once you provide a mandate and you would approve of at least a tentative work plan, then I am prepared to reallocate within the staff in accordance with the work plan that you set up. I mean, I think that's a minimum that we will have to do. Other questions, comments, Mr. Harper, did you have one? No, ma'am. I was just going to see if there were any other questions. We need action immediately. Well, we're not going to, we, I do not believe are in a position to adopt this charter today. What I'd like to do is request of Mr. Harper that, as he's indicated, he wants to communicate independently with members of the Audit Committee. This dialogue goes exactly in the direction we needed to go into, which is have you all understand the sensitivity of this document and the urgency, really, and let's move forward with that and hopefully at our next meeting bring forth a draft document that begins to shape that direction in a way that gives the Chancellor and Mr. Harper the direction they need on the actual staffing and work plan. Are there any other questions or comments on this issue? Madam Chair, if I may, I'll repeat again. What I'm going to be doing is contacting each of you individually prior to the March meeting of the Board of Governors to schedule a session with you to discuss some of the issues we've discussed today, to look at both the reference documents, the supporting documents that help develop the charter, and also to get your insights and comments and suggestions on how we frame the charter as the basic outline of how this committee is going to operate and how the internal audit and compliance function. I will also be contacting the chairs of the audit committees of the various, of the boards of trustees of the State University System. I've already distributed this document in a limited distribution to the State University Audit Council and plan on sending it to the Council of Administration and Financial Affairs, CAFA, to get their input. I guess my last question to you, Madam Chair and the members of the committee on this issue, is are there any other parties that you want to specifically identify that I should seek guidance and input from? I think that's a comprehensive list from my vantage point. Does anybody else have any thoughts? And that gives you sufficient direction going forward? Yes, ma'am. I think so. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much and for the effort that you've put into it. We really do appreciate it. Mr. Harper is also going to give us a brief report on the FAMU task force, so if you would like to do that. And I had a, I have an outline of doing that and I want to follow that, but I think I'll do it in reverse order. I did appear before a legislative committee earlier this month and I was asked questions that really went to the heart of some of the issues that the Chancellor has highlighted and that we've discussed previously. I was asked questions not only about the process that we're going through in the task force on FAMU completing its objectives and mission, but also the results. And in this particular instance, questions about how any of the issues that are a part of that particular matter have been impacted or are present at other universities. 
course, I couldn't answer those two questions. And the result of that, at least one of the takeaways, is that our communication with the legislature, as always, is extremely critical. Since that particular appearance where I was asked to give results, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about where we are in that process, we went back and talked to staff and to individual members of that committee. In addition, we have meetings scheduled, follow-up meetings, with other key legislators who have an interest in this. I guess what I'm getting to, Governor Martin and Governor Duncan and other members of the committee, is that at this point in time, what we're learning from having to put together a team to look at the issues that are part of the task force on FAMU's work plan and our goals and objectives is really a litmus test of how you deal with it with limited resources. For example, one of the responses, or at least suggestions you're going to hear me make, is that we have to leverage off of the state university system personnel. And a key element of the task force on FAMU's operations is to look at the IT issues raised by previous audits. In that regard, we've utilized the CIOs from two universities and our CIO, Ramon Padilla. They've worked extremely hard, put in many, many hours developing a framework for looking at the corrective actions. We have other university teams that are committed, even though they haven't been actively engaged because we've got to give them information. What I've been encouraged by, and I don't want to overplay this, is that if we can come up with the framework, and we're learning a lot about how to do that in the task force on FAMU project, then we can answer some of those questions. Because one of the questions I could not answer is issues raised by some of those audits. Mr. Harper, do they exist at other universities in the system? What about some of the other operational audits, which I do review, the ones from the University of Florida, the one from FAU, which gained the attention of the Joint Auditing Committee. I think there were two hearings on that in addition to the Chancellor's appearance. So that is why I think I'm encouraged by the process that we're going through now and how you can take some funding, leverage that funding by getting subject matter experts who can do some of the real groundwork, but also utilize those university personnel who are experts in that area. It is not easy, but it can be done. My quick report on the task force. Task force has now met eight times. Our last meeting was on December 19th. The highlight of that meeting was that the task force not only heard a report on where we were in our field work in looking at the corrective action plans and making an assessment objective and independent, but also designated four other projects that they wanted us to focus on in the remainder of the time that we have. They included coming up with a way to assist FAMU in the sponsored research and grants area, that is, coming up with a procurement or a firm that can assist in that critical area. Also, in areas that FAMU identified as a critical need, training, and also direct assistance in the accounting function. In addition to that, they approved the Creative Solutions, our auditing services forum, to do the information technology validation and verification process. That work plan is being developed right now. The CIOs will report out at our next meeting, at least generally, on where we're going to go. And I'll just shorten this a little bit and answer questions. The IT issues are definitely ones that are complicated and very much, in this case, technical. I've been not only encouraged, but we will be able to do some of the work in the validation verification part of it, but not all of it. Because many of the corrective actions are going to take time to see if they are, in fact, going to be effective on an ongoing basis. Now, the task force now has three meetings scheduled. We will meet on January 30th for a conference call, on February 11th to discuss the draft report, and on February 25th to review a final draft for preparation and final editing for distribution as of March 1st, as is required by the legislative mandate. That report will come to the Board of Governors and to the legislative leaders as required. What I would ask the members of this committee to do is, at this point in time, I want to make sure that you're on the distribution list for all communications and materials related to the task force. Because I anticipate that this audit committee will play a key role in reviewing the report of the task force on FAMU and reviewing the findings and recommendations. Now, the last part of my report is how far along are we and where are we? I could not answer certain questions about the results. That is, in certain areas where deficiencies or weaknesses have been identified, has a corrective action plan put in place by President Ammons and his team completed that particular issue? Has it resolved the issue? I will tell you that we're about 50 to 60 percent done in gathering sufficient information for us to test, that is, to do by observation, review of documents, or interviews, how effective those are. 
The uh, team from uh, Creative Solutions includes now four full-time auditors. Since we're going to start the IT portion of the project, probably the middle of next week, we're gonna add three more individuals doing field work. Field work started right around, uh, or right after uh, the December detail work plan. Actually started before December 3rd. So we will be putting in probably several hundred hours of work between now and the February 11th date that the task force will be looking at a draft report. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to um, just spend a minute, because um, that's all we have, to, to give you a very brief frame of reference. The, the philosophy that the task force has taken with regard to the oversight has been to allow for President Ammons and his group to put together their corrective action plan. We had input into it and worked with the Board of Trustees in um, evaluating that document, but it, it was the effort of President Ammons and his administrative group. And, and our decision was to bring in the validation and verification process of that corrective action plan as it was implemented, which puts us at the tail end of the exercise drawing our conclusions and, and really it gets us under the gun in terms of meeting the legislative deadline of March 1st. But it was the right decision in my view because given the transition of administrations and the great deal of, um, of activity going on at the institution at the time that we engaged the task force in this effort, for us to have gone in and begun any form of implementation process without allowing the administration to implement its own corrective action it was our conclusion would have added so much confusion to the mix that it would have been very difficult for President Ammons and his administration to function effectively. And so this process of allowing that corrective action to move forward and then validating and verifying, I think will give us a better um, means of measuring where the institution is and, will, and, and is a more effective process. The second part that it's important for all of you to understand is that the um, the way in which that validation and verification is occurring is different from the corrective action plan that was implemented by the institution in the earlier phase because there was a Pete Marwick corrective action plan and so one might question why did that not yield um, a sufficient or adequate result and I think the, the reason that I've the conclusion I've drawn from my observations is that it's the validation and verification of how that correction active plan was implemented that was missing. The corrective action plan was a very thorough document. It was well thought out. It was well articulated. But there was no ultimate oversight as to how those corrective actions, while they look good on paper, were actually implemented in the field at the institution day in and day out. That is what we are testing now in a different way so that we will be able to say this corrective action plan has demonstrated success in these areas. So the report that will be coming out is that validation process of testing on the corrective actions. And will it be perfect? No. Will we be able to say that we've tested everything? No. But it, it will give us a much, much more thorough um, assessment of where the institution is than we've been able to achieve in the past. I would also like to, to give you the confidence that I feel in the, in the accretive group. They are highly professional. They understand this business and what they are doing in terms of digging in um, to the verification process. And um, I'm frankly looking forward to the report and, and feeling very good about our understanding of the situation as they come forward with their conclusions. So obviously we'll be giving you more detail, but I, I wanted you to understand that because when you begin seeing this material, you'll I'm sure be confused by what you're seeing. So I'm glad, um, Mr. Harper, that you're planning on bringing the audit committee into that documentation at this stage because I think it's timely and I'm sorry I've run over. Um, but Madam Chair, if I can just yeah. make three more points and I will, I will try to be brief but I'll answer any questions. I know we're running into the next committee's time. Uh, first of all, 
at that particular uh, uh, legislative committee uh, hearing, I have had a chance to go back and talk to several members of the committee. We will have a follow-up meeting with uh, Senator Lynn where we're going to lay out in more detail our work plan. But three things that I can tell you right now before we get, before we get done. One is the level of cooperation and assistance and support from the FAMU senior staff from President Ammons on down has been excellent. Without that, we're not going to be able to objectively and independently report out, nor will we be able to get anywhere in this project. I've pointed that out in each of those conversations and tried to do so. I know President Ammons is right behind me uh, at that particular presentation. Uh, that is excellent. As a member of our uh, task force, happens to not only be involved with the task force, but the chairman of the Board of Trustees of FAMU has been totally engaged. He and I not only have briefings, but he is totally engaged and has given his full support and extra time to this effort. Secondly, the Auditor General. What we want to do in a technical sense, but it's very real in a substantive sense, is make sure that the work that we're doing can be relied upon by the Auditor General when they come back sometime later this year to look at whether those corrective actions have in fact been implemented. That is to have a an understanding that the way we're doing it, they can rely upon, will be of significant benefit to the university. And we believe, after our various meetings with them, that we're about there on that. And then lastly, as we're going through the corrective action plan and going through this process, we have been making suggestions, suggestions about how it might be improved, but also suggestions that might put us in a better position to say that we've given value. And with the help of a lot of other people, uh, Madam Chair, if we can get those projects and procurements in place to reach those critical areas, and I believe that we can, give direct benefit to the university in the sponsored research and grants area, for example. Thank you. Right. Any questions? Questions, comments? If not, this committee is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take a very short uh, five-minute break between the committees. Yeah. Thank you.